Okay, I'm going to break um, the discussion of Thoreau and Zerzan into two shorter um, lectures. Having already introduced who Henry David Thoreau was, I'm going to plunge right into some of the things that he says in the selection from Walden. And I'm going to take a fairly um, openly critical stance to what Thoreau says, mainly because I think it's a good lesson in how we can apply previous knowledge that we've learned to the current um, instance. I started to do that in the last lecture, applying knowledge that I had um, and which I used to interpret Thoreau and, and Zerzan. And now as I go through some of the writings, I want to do that a little bit further with more specificity. So if you've ever uh, learned anything about Henry David Thoreau, you've heard about the book Walden, and you probably have in your mind this peaceful, kind of isolated man living in in the wilderness by a pond, kind of romantic, kind of um, in a way sad as well, trying to find peace and tranquility and all of that. Um, but one of the great values of actually going to the text and reading it, or reading it again if you read it before, for instance in high school, and reading it a little bit more uh, carefully, is that we find that oftentimes our initial perceptions or our fuzzy memories of what a what a writer represents get jolted quite a bit when we actually read the text carefully and that is the case with this selection from Walden. It starts out with a discussion of the westward trek uh, into the wilderness as he puts it or into the wild and there's a great deal of praise for the idea of questing as I might put it or conquest um, really, and he says that we need to forget the old world and its institutions, meaning the Europeans who have come to America, they need to forget their European past and its institutions, probably particularly he's thinking of the authoritarian or aristocratic type institutions, monarchy, aristocracy, things like that. We need to basically, he, he says, uh, drink of the Lathian stream, meaning true forgetfulness, and in that way we can uh, come to the new world and uh, create brand new ideas and again get new life. So this idea of forgetfulness as good and the idea that, that too much knowledge of history and uh, a lack of ability to forget can weigh us down and oppress us and keep us from making creative changes and going out and living and experiencing life, perhaps because of guilt, definitely because of a sense of veneration for the past. That's a very Nietzschean statement. Nietzsche says the exact same thing in the use and abuse, use and abuse of history for life, or um, it's sometimes entitled On the Advantage and Disadvantage of History for Life. So the first couple of pages, the theme in Thoreau's uh, selection here is those who quest should quest. I have a quote here that uh, is Thoreau extensively quoting from a geographer by the name of Guillot. And he says, as the plant is made for the animal, as the vegetable world is made for the animal world, America is made for the man of the old world. So think about that right there. In what way is the plant made for the animal? The animal eats the plant. That's the way the whole, you know, cycle goes, right? The animal eats the plant, and then bigger animals eat that animal. Um, and so he's literally saying America is made for the Europeans to eat, that is to consume, to come and make their own. He says, leaving the highlands of Asia, man descends from station to station towards Europe. So that's the first step of, you know, the conquest, westward conquest of Europe first. He says, each of his steps is marked by a new civilization superior to the preceding by a great power of development. So here is an expression of admiration for civilization. It's a type, it's a particular kind of civilization. The type of civilization that is new, that has been brought by people who are from elsewhere and who um, are creating something brand new. He goes on, he says, when he has exhausted the rich soil of Europe and reinvigorated himself, 
then recommences his adventurous career westward as in the earliest ages. And of course, this westward career then uh, turns its focus to America and continues that westward quest. So we have peaceful, quiet Thoreau actually seeming to endorse uh, conquest. So I just find that interesting. We see in his thought what I would call nature determinism. We saw that uh, to a great extent in the literature on eco-fascism, interestingly. He is a believer that the, t the soil that you're around and the climate you're in um, greatly affects the way that you think and the type of character and spirit that you have. Thoreau says, I believe that climate does, does thus react on man. And elaborating, he says, if the heavens of America appear infinitely higher and the stars brighter, I trust that these facts are symbolical of the height to which the philosophy and poetry and religion of her, her inhabitants may one day soar. So again, it's not that, that Thoreau is against all civilization, but he's for new, bright, vibrant um, civilization that can create great things, great philosophy and poetry and religion. And you can't get that staying put. You have to go out into the wilderness, and you have to conquer new land, and you have to breathe new air. And this gives life to ideas. And in, fa in effect, it creates the conditions in which people can create themselves anew. Thoreau engages in nature romanticism. We see this throughout the selection, but it appears pretty early on in the naive non-inclusion and romanticization of the Native Americans. Um, they are there, but they're kind of in the background. They're in the background as a beautiful sort of idyllic piece of the scenery, but there's no real attention to the interaction between the settlers and the Native Americans. Um, there's a sort of romanticization of, the way, of their way of life in bits and pieces here. Per, at one point he remarks that they are capable of eating raw meat, and this seems to be a sign of their vigorous nature that maybe the Europeans can now also have um, a return to that vigorous, robust nature that comes from living in a more rustic environment. So the Native Americans are there in the background of Walden's uh, scenery, uh, the book, that is, but they are not really there. He, he doesn't spend any time thinking about them as a people or as individuals and, and uh, their way of life apart from what it means for the Europeans who have come to America. Looking at a panorama, which is a giant painting with all sorts of scenes on it, of the Mississippi River and beholding Indians moving west across the stream on the panorama, Thoreau remarks, I saw that this was a Rhine stream, so like an old world river, right? But of a different kind, that the foundations of castles were yet to be laid and the famous bridges were yet to be thrown over the river. And I felt that this was the heroic age itself, though we know it not. For the hero is commonly the simplest and obscurest of men. So again, he sees this Mississippi River as this great new Rhine, you know, a new river around which new civilizations can emerge um, and which will create new heroes, new settings uh, for people to display their creative power. He reminds us of Rousseau when he says, I would have every man so much like a wild antelope, so much a part and parcel of nature that his very person should thus sweetly advertise our senses of his presence. In other words, we should be able to smell him and know he's there, like an animal. Um, and Rousseau was all about, you know, uh, raising people in as, as natural a setting as possible and allowing them to learn from their own physical experience, learn how to be sensitive to their environment like an animal would be sensitive to his environment, and therefore be very much alive, Rousseau said. Also, in and around the same spot, uh, Thoreau mentions Darwin, uh, who was also becoming well-known at, at this point. And he says, Darwin the naturalist says, a white man bathing by the side of a Tahitian 
was like a plant bleached by the gardener's art compared with the fine dark green one growing vigorously in the open fields, even though that's a reference to Tahiti. Um, uh, Thoreau was using it as a way of pointing to the effect that this new world can have on the white man, how the white man comes less vigorous and less natural and less strong and less adapted uh, by the side of the Native Americans, but by living there he adapts and he begins to take on these qualities himself. Thoreau exhibits the idea that good soil creates good ideas. We've already looked at this a bit, but here's a couple of other examples that come later on in the essay. He says, in such a soil, that is the soil of the new world, in such a soil grew Homer and Confucius and the rest. And out of such a wilderness comes the reformer eating locusts and wild honey. That's a reference to John the Baptist and a sort of erstwhile reference to Christ. So great thinkers like Homer and Confucius, foundational thinkers like John the Baptist and Christ himself, they are founders. They are founders of a new way of thinking. And here we have uh, Thoreau basically saying, in the New World, in America, we have a place where new ideas like this can be created. So he says the old world yielded its old mythology, and it has given up what it can to our imagination, you might say. But the new world will yield an even richer new mythology, literature, poetry, and art, um, and will carry humanity forward, um, advancing more than the old word world could, which he says is exhausted. And then we see flat-out European superiority in Thoreau's language. Um, not just in the places I'm going to indicate, but in a lot of places in this short selection. But I found this one particularly reminiscent of Locke, John Locke's uh, political philosophy from the uh, 17th century in England. Uh, Locke was famous for saying that even a day laborer in England under uh, the beginnings of what came to be called industrialization uh, even a day laborer in England was better off than a king or chieftain Native American in uh, the New World. Um, here Thoreau says, I think the farmer, that is the European who comes with his farming techniques, I think the farmer displaces the Indian even because he redeems the meadow and so makes himself stronger and in some respects more natural. Well, you can see that that's problematic, especially for someone who values nature and sort of the idea of pristine nature. This kind of flies in the face of that. If you had the idea that Thoreau necessarily valued pristine nature, that's not quite true if we take this statement seriously. He's saying that the European makes the meadow better by turning it into farmland. And in fact, that is more natural in a way because he redeems the meadow. That's pretty strong language. It's a almost quasi-religious language, isn't it? Of redeeming the wilderness and turning it into something valuable. Similarly, Locke said, God gave everybody the land in common, but it is largely a wasteland until it's put into cultivation, and he who can make it profitable, he who can make it productive and profitable, then turns that land in common into land that's owned in particular um, because it can be made more fruitful for everybody in Locke's uh, theory. Something similar to that way of thinking is going on here and of course that's the thinking that's involved in um, you know nascent capitalism. So again uh, Thoreau may be right or wrong about this uh, but I think that it, it by focusing on, on this kind of statement, realizing what Thoreau is actually saying, we get a different impression of Thoreau than we might first have when we're sort of looking, looking at and reading the flowery language of admiration for nature. He follows that statement up by saying, the very winds blew the Indian's cornfield into the meadow and pointed out the way which he had not the skill to follow. 
implication being that the Europeans had that skill, and so therefore they were more qualified to take over those meadows. Finally, uh, excuse me, Thoreau um, gives us some statements that I would call anti-leveling or anti-equality and anti-intellectualism. Two of them remind me very much of Nietzschean philosophy, too. He says, Undoubtedly, all men are not equally fit subjects for civilization, and because the majority, like dogs and sheep, are tame by inherited disposition, this is no reason why the others should have their natures broken that they may be reduced to the same level. Okay, now, Nietzsche said something very similar. Um, he did not see civilization as a bonus. He saw civilization in its, um, you know, fullest form as oppressive, as tending towards making people all equal, subjects of the same law, repressed by uh, a type of religion that would have uh, regulated their choices and their behavior. And Nietzsche said most people will sign up for a type of government that levels people, particularly in his times, uh, some form of democracy or socialism because that will protect them in their mediocrity uh, from those who are naturally stronger than themselves and naturally superior. And for Nietzsche, that's how democracies and, and socialist and communist countries get started. Um, the weak majority attempts to protect themselves from the strong by creating these structures that repress everybody's lust for freedom and for experience um, which the weak will trade in for safety. So again, let's take a look at what Thoreau is saying. He says, undoubtedly all men are not equally fit subjects for civilization. In other words, some men are not cowards who would prefer to be safe rather than to be free. Okay? That might not pop out of that first statement, but that's, that's what he's saying. And then he compares the majority to dogs and sheep tame by inherited disposition. They've been living in systems of obedience long enough that they, um, they, they are, are used to obeying and they're afraid to step out of line. But he says that is no reason why others sh should have the, their natures broken by these systems, that they may be reduced to the same level. And that goes along with his praise of the westward trek. That's why America is so seductive to Thoreau because it provides this fresh territory where the strongest people, where the most hardy people can find their way uh, to live their lives the way they want to without excessive uh, repression of their instincts, without excessive control of their behavior. Never mind that he didn't do this himself and sat on a pond for two years and then went back to working at the pencil factory. He's, and, you know, if we blame thinkers for not living out their lives the way they wrote, we would have very few that we could take seriously. So the ideas need to be, um, I guess, evaluated in their own light. And that's what I'm attempting to do, and I'm being honest about being openly critical about this. For the most part, lectures try to be somewhat objective, but I, I'm trying to model for you how you might... Uh, critically read this text because it, it seemed like a good one from my perspective. Since I went into it having remembered a sort of misty romantic version of Thoreau and when I assigned it, which is the first time I've gone back and read this in a while, I could see so much more going on in it that I didn't see when I read it in mm, probably high school or maybe junior college. Again, sounding like Nietzsche, he says, It is said that knowledge is power and the like. Methinks there is an equal need of a society for the diffusion of useful ignorance, what we will call beautiful knowledge, a knowledge useful in the higher sense. For what is most of our boasted knowledge but a conceit that we know something which robs us of the advantage of our actual ignorance? Nietzsche, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, was very critical of um, the typical intellectual of his day, what we might now call the academics, the um, scholars, but also the talking heads of um, television news and, and uh, blogs and podcasts and all sorts of things. Um, 
but especially probably academia. Um, the academics, according to Nietzsche, uh, sort of created obscure knowledge to mark off their territory, and there's a great deal of truth in that, that academic knowledge can be so, become so obscure it's not applicable. Uh, but there is a deep strain in American thought more generally that is anti-intellectual uh, and which praises a sort of, as he puts it here, useful ignorance um, as being hardier and stronger and frankly more masculine than um, excessive knowledge. It also reminds me of the debate again between Socrates and Callicles because Callicles also champions a sort of useful ignorance. You know, he says, I don't have time for playing your intellectual games. I've got to be about the business of making money and having political power. And all of that knowledge just kind of weighs me down. Again, what do you need to, to know to go into the wilderness? Well, you need very practical knowledge, like how to ride a horse, how to use an axe, how to make a fire, how to shoot a, a rifle, um, and, and maybe most importantly, how to be courageous and uh, more or less um, not see boundaries uh, that you can't cross. That's not book learning. And so here we see this very typical American distinction between book learning and practical knowledge. And it's practical knowledge which is upheld as superior. Um, but the dark side of anti-intellectualism is that it often turns into an attack on the intellectual class, the very people um, that aspire to be the next Homer, the next Socrates, the next uh, even John the Baptist, uh, people whom he's praised, um, or the next Nietzsche or Darwin, right, um, or Rousseau, uh, th this anti-intellectualism can quickly turn on them too. And so Thoreau may not anticipate that, but it's a, it's a problematic um, aspect of this type of romantic, romanticization of all things natural and um, condemnation of civiliz civilization are all things uh, sophisticated. He uh, says, reminiscent to Rousseau, my desire for knowledge is intermittent. And frankly, he had a lot of it. He had a lot of book learning, obviously. There's a lot of intellectual influences either coming out directly or um, indirectly in this short text. So backing up, he says, My desire for knowledge is intermittent, but my desire to bathe my head in atmospheres unknown to my feet is perennial and constant. The highest that we can attain to is not knowledge, but sympathy with intelligence. Again, very much what Rousseau says in that second discourse uh, on the origins of inequality when he talks about how, you know, people joining um, communities is not necessarily natural, but people having a sort of instinctual pity or sympathy for each other in dire consequences is a natural gut level thing. Uh, which makes them good, which makes them have this sort of instinctual, gut-level, moral sense. And if we can regain that through intelligence, if we can somehow um, add on to that instinctual sense of fellow feeling some knowledge of its goodness, then we can uh, reconcile it, to a certain extent, with a new type of civilization. Okay. Anyway, so there are some thoughts and ideas on uh, Thoreau, and I'll be interested to hear what your reactions were of this same piece. Bye.